Welcome to Live Life Better. This is Scott Eastwood. That's right. I am here and I am there. I'm everywhere. I'm in your ears. I'm at home. I'm in your bedroom. If you want me to be, obviously, on the podcast. Don't don't go there. Don't go dark with me, people. Where are we going, Scott? I don't know where we're going, but you know what? I just wanted to tell you why I started this podcast. Because for people who are new listeners and they don't know, I did this podcast for you. I did it to inspire you. I want you to live the best version of your life. Um, My feeling is, uh, my view about the world is we are on this planet for a very short time. And instead of arguing and bitching and whining about bullshit, I think we should be more focused on what we want to do and what inspires us, what makes us happy. Um, And so that's what I want. And I hope this podcast helps you with that. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be interviewing a ton of people from all over the world in a ton of different varieties and categories. And hopefully that will help you. And in this episode of the podcast, we talked to Adam Gazaley. Now, Adam Gazaley is a badass. Okay, He is a doctor. He has his PhD in neuroscience from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. He is doing incredible work. Um, with VR and AI to improve cognitive brain function. Now, this is to hopefully replace pharmaceutical drugs that we just pump into the system. Not cool. Um, We talk a lot about um, the complexity of the brain in this episode, uh, what makes us tick, um, and the steps that he's taking... uh, to build out this these these video games really that will help people ultimately so check it out i uh, hope you like it i know i sure enjoyed the uh, podcast we are rolling what up adam gazaley thank you so much for coming today thanks for having me here yeah Excited. yeah i actually i found you in tools of titans ah, t- originally Nice. <laughs> and uh, I was I was like, wow, I was like, this guy is doing a lot of really cool stuff. I was like, we should interview him. Cool. Well, this I'm is happy amazing. to be here. Yeah. Yeah. You came in from San Francisco, right? Yep. San Francisco. Short trip. Reminds me that I don't spend enough time in LA, given that I'm pretty close, on, but just don't get here as often as I should. Well, it's, it's a tough city. It's a fun city. It's probably better for you because you come in for a couple days and yeah. you get to enjoy it. Exactly. Uh, if you live here, it can be a tough city. Yeah. But yeah. I had a great time. There's a lot of really exciting things going on here. So I've just, since you invited me, I figured let me use this opportunity and reach out to a lot of sure. friends and companies in LA and see what's going on. So it's yeah, you fun. said you said you were uh, you were meeting with some VR companies. Yeah, a lot of VR and artists and people. I'm really interested in uh, technology and its ability to create powerful experiences beyond just entertainment and to improving how our minds function. And there's a ton of that going on down here. So it's been great to see. Sure, well, because that's 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 what you've been you know in your field of study, right? I mean, you you're a doctor. Yep. Uh, of of neuroscience. Yep. Um, but you you started a company right a few yep. years ago mm-hmm. that um, you're, you're making video games to improve cognitive uh, yeah right function yeah, or you exactly. know possibly so with these with VR you that would be like the next evolution to this yeah you know we're we're interested in you know just to maybe give a little framework for that uh, at my field med, I'm a neurologist and a neuroscientist we've relied pretty much exclusively on molecules, what we call drugs, to treat conditions of the mind, whether they be how we regulate our emotions, depression, anxiety, aggression, how we pay attention, how we remember things, with this approach for 60 years. And we really don't have a solution that's not also accompanied by lots of side effects, and a lot of people can't tolerate it, And but we have no, everything else has sort of been marginalized to the sides, whether it's meditation, or physical exercise, or therapy. And so I saw this opportunity maybe part of living in San Francisco and seeing all the crazy tech innovation going on. Could we use technology to actually harness an old, ancient way of improving how our minds function, which is through experience, like meditation and ancient practices like that. And so the the way that I decided to deliver that experience was through video games. They're fun, they're engaging, they're immersive, but they also have this ability to update how we are challenging you and how we're rewarding you in the moment based on your performance. We call this the closed loop. So you get this tight feedback between how you're engaging in something and how we're challenging you and and giving you feedback. And this is what we're now showing in our lab is a very powerful way to change how the brain functions, to literally rewire those networks so that they're more optimized. 
and we're showing that it crawls across all sorts of age groups and different clinical conditions. VR, you're right, is the next evolution of even a more real world immersive experience that we hypothesize will have even stronger benefits. So I hear closed loop, uh, for those who don't, I've, you know, I've read a little bit about it. There's a closed loop and there's open loop, right? Mm -hmm. So open loop being what we currently, how we cognitively interact with the world. Yeah, I mean, open loop is, it's a, just an ineffective way to change things, but we do it all the time. It means that there's this long, sloppy, non-quantitative cycle between how we intervene to change something and then how we update that intervention depending on what happened. So for example, mm -hmm. you go to the doctor because you're depressed or you're, you have anxiety and they diagnose you as having a condition that needs medical treatment, you get a drug, you go home, you subjectively monitor your effects and side effects, maybe months pass. Then you go back to your doctor, you're like, well, this is what I felt. And they're like, okay, we're gonna go up 10 milligrams and cycle through this process again. That's an open sure. loop. Long long time between, not quantita quantitative, a closed loop, which is used in the physical world all the time. Um, even things When you like, say physical world, what do you mean? Like for example, like even modern day dryers. I mean non-biological systems. How, sure. how we operate drills and so that we don't fracture drill bits when they exert pressure on the ground. There's a feedback system that's judging all the time how much pressure is actually being exerted and how much a drill uh, diamond can take before fracturing. But in biological systems, there's not too many examples of it. The closed loop system is where you intervene in some way and you record the impact as rapidly as possible and then use that data to refine what you're doing and then apply it and keep cycling over and over again. The closed loop video game, the video game is challenging you and it's targeting different brain networks through the experience it's creating. If it's too hard for you, it just backs off automatically. It knows that based on how fast and accurate you are. Now, what is it plugged into your your you know, your senses, your neurons that, that, you know, have a reading, so it, it... It's a great question. So right now, how we've started was the simplest closed loop where it's just your performance metrics. So you play a game, you tap, you move, we could see how fast you are, how accurate your movements are, uh, and the, the latency, the delays between when we give you a signal and when you respond to it. And then, so we just use that data to say, okay, now we're gonna give it a little faster, now we're gonna pull back where we're going, and we've already started doing this at our, at our lab at UCSF, is recording your heart rate, recording okay. your emotional responses using physiology, recording your brain activity in real time, and we feed all of that data into the game engine. So now the game understands you in a way deeper way than just how accurate or fast you are. It understands you in a way maybe that no one else ever could. And then it feeds back an environment, let's say virtual reality, that's even more immersive than we've ever created. And so this is the closed loop that we're developing. And it's another artificial intelligence challenge, a machine learning challenge to drive a system of information from you flowing into a software engine and then flowing back an experience that's targeted to how you need to be challenged. So, what is the, the, how did you start this? What were you, you know, how does one start a video game company that's going to? <laughs> yeah, well, I had really started, my, my research for 25 years had been studying the aging brain and showing that when we get older, our memory declines, our attention gets worse, our processing mm -hmm. speed diminishes. It's sort of a bummer story. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, especially if you're a scientist. Mm -hmm. But if you're an older adult, and when I say older, I mean like older than 40, like okay. older than 30. This is something wow. that, this is something that is like a lifelong process. Of, sure. You know, and our whole body changes our, you know, muscles, our bones, our hair, um, our brains. And so I had done a tremendous amount of work and ran a big lab showing in detail with real time with brain recordings what's happening, why this is occurring. And around 2000, as I was, I do not want to spend the rest of my life reporting the bad news. You know, that our brains are very vulnerable to distraction and multitasking, that it gets it declines as we get older. I want to do something to help people in my life and do it directly as possible. So I started thinking, how can we use our expertise in neuroscience and the methods that we use in the lab to understand the brain to flip it around and to try to improve brain function? So wait, what, what, are, what were the previous ways to in, you know improve brain function or to study it or to I mean the system is dominated by molecular approaches so okay. as a as a chemical right chemical okay using a drug using sure. a ph pharmaceutical that goes by many names it's all exactly the same thing yep. it's the pills that we take uh, that change largely how our, our neurotransmitters, how our brain neurons communicate with each other. But that is a 
a sledgehammer. It is a blunt instrument. Sure. We're not targeting those molecules selectively to different networks in the brain. And that's really how the brain works. It works through networks, areas con connecting and communicating dynamically over time. We don't have a way to target those brain networks using a chemical. You're just blanket bombing the whole thing. Exactly. And, and that is exactly why we have side effects. Wow. Because we have to increase the doses to these high levels to get the effects we want. you less depressed. You, 12-year-old, are paying better attention or at least less hyperactive in class. Uh -huh. And then they have personality effects that are unwanted. They have nausea. They, you know, there's all sorts of consequences. And so instead of reaching into the toolkit that we've been building, which are these you know, chemicals, the idea was that we could create an experience to activate the brain in a selective way, because that's how the brain works. It activates selectively given your interactions with the world around you. And then through this closed loop system of constantly putting pressure on it, we could change it. It's not so different than what we do in the physical fitness world. When you go to the gym and you have the benefit of a personal trainer that's right up there with you, sure. looking at what weights you do and saying, we're just <clears throat> gonna push a little bit more based on how you're doing. Right, so that's a closed loop system too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if if you're fortunate and have the resources enough to have a high level professional trainer, they're a closed loop system. They're you know uh, observing your strengths, your weaknesses in real time, and they're pushing you. But not everyone has that. The idea was that this is an amazing opportunity of technology to create these systems that uh, are personalized to us and challenge our brains in a manner that because we have plasticity, and plasticity means that our brain changes itself physically, chemically, structurally, in response to experience, right? This is the entire basis of learning. But because our brains have that ability, all we're trying to do is harness it. By, by giving it an experience that's high level, adaptive, uh, and personalized enough to change it. And so that was the idea. And when you're thinking about how to create an experience that people will actually do and enjoy doing and do for a long period of time, I was like, video games. Sure. Well, it seems, it seems amazing. I mean, it, it seems like common sense when you say it now because <laughs> I was diagnosed ADHD when mm. I was a kid and, and my, and you know, doctors like, oh, put them, stick them on Ritalin and you know, the whole bit. And then I, I never liked it. Uh, I was on not for very long. Um, but a close friend of mine uh, was on it, or 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 Adderall, or whatever yeah. the difference. Yeah. I think that the same. Adderall is right? more common now, but they're the same. The stimulants. Same, same the thing. Stimulants. Right? Um, he was on it uh, through college and abused it mm -hmm. uh, terribly, and then because of that, started having insomnia and all the side effects that came along with it. Ultimately, now uh, suffers from uh, mental health disorder, mm -hmm. uh, multiple, I think. And I'm not mm -hmm. a doctor, so I couldn't mm -hmm. diagnose him. But um, it's it's really it was really interesting to see, and 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 I have got to place some blame on the abuse of the Adderall, just because I don't know if it exacerbated. A pre-existing, you know, stuff going on, but I'm sure you've seen that a lot, you know, with with people, and and I know you talk about, you know, ADHD, be this becoming, you know, maybe something that could yeah. help that. Yeah. Where does that? What What are you seeing in in, in common? Uh, you know, what, what what the kids these days and everyone using this, abusing this drug? I mean, you, you you nailed it. I don't have a ton more to add. You know, except that. You know, the six million kids that have this diagnosis, two million, a third of them are not taking anything, even though they're diagnosed, either because they can't tolerate it, their parents just refuse to place them on one of these type of medications. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, a large other percentage that are on it, but not happy about it or abusing it, as you say, sharing it with their friends in college. And, sure. Um, what we're now doing with... Uh, both at, at UCSF and uh, the company that, that you mentioned, Achille, which I started, is we're not just trying to create these video games as brain games to improve cognition. We're, we're literally trying to take these through the FDA approval process. Really? And create a new medicine. Okay. So that's that's the goal, and we're getting pretty close to it. So for ADHD, we completed a, what's known as a phase three registration trial. And what that means is as you move through the FDA process to get approval, whether it's a drug or a medical device, you have these different stages of research studies that just keep getting bigger and bigger and more rigorous. Phase three is a multi-site randomized control trial. So we finished a study of children with ADHD, 
that will put in 350 kids in two groups. One group played this game that we created that we think is going to improve their attention, and the other played another game that we thought might have different benefits, but not necessarily improving their attention, a word game. And then across 20 sites throughout the U.S., they engaged in this blinded study, and we released the data in December showing that we could have a meaningful uh, improvement on an attention measure only in the group that had the the medicine, the digital medicine sure. that we, that we uh, um, uh, treated them with. And so now over this year, we're in the process of bringing this through FDA approval, meaning that hopefully by 2019, a doctor could pull out a prescription pad and write down this video game as opposed to Adderall as a so, treatment. So when you say that though, how long does that attention span improve for? Mm -hmm. Is that something that's improved you know, on a, like a, for a 24 hour period? Yeah, it's a good question. So right now we, we sort of ran this study just like Adderall studies, which is you finish and then within the next week you start assessing and we see that improvement. In parallel to getting FDA approval for this as a treatment, we're running multiple other studies to understand the physiology of it, the mechanism in the brain, to understand the appropriate dosing, um, you know, and to understand how it actually works with Adderall. Maybe we could give what we currently think of as a medication, these chemicals, at a much lower dose, minimize the side effects, and they'll have a positive interaction. None of this is known. It's a completely new field that we're just sort of you know venturing into looking is, at. Is this. is that is that the case for most of the brain that we're just we're really just scratching the surface of what we know? Undoubtedly, I mean the brain is it, it feels infinitely complex to neuroscientists. It's oh, the more we figure out, the more mysteries are are unlocked or challenged you know in front of us that we have to address, but. Um, I don't want to wait anymore until we figure out more about the brain. I feel like we know a lot about the brain. Mm -hmm. It's time to translate what we do know as best we can into helping people's brains become more effective at, at you know interacting with the environment, interacting with each other, interacting with themselves. We have to start translating neuroscience into solutions more rapidly. So... That's that's really that's that's interesting. I mean, just think you just you know kids already like to play video games now, so plug them in, get them going. What is this video game like? So we have at, at Neuroscape, which is our UCSF center, we have six different games that we've developed, and they're broad. Some are very slow. One game is a meditation-inspired game that you play oh, with wow. your eyes closed. Oh, so that's we bring great. yeah, we bring principles of meditation into the closed loop, where it's adaptive. You get rewards, but you're meditating. We actually have data on that that we have not published, but we're writing it right now showing that even millennials um, playing the game, 20 year olds in San Francisco, we can improve their sustained attention, their attention span, just through engagement in a meditation inspired game. Does it teach you how to meditate? through the game sort of just sort of steps you into it it steps it baby steps you into the process of focusing your attention internally on your breath being aware of your mind wandering mm -hmm. and then pulling your attention back and it does that very gradually and now we showed in research that we can get benefits uh, outside of that algorithm that gameplay into other tests of attention abilities i, I you know i know that when i meditate i i definitely have more more cognitive ability. I also feel like in the morning, I especially have more cognitive ability. Like mm -hmm. I'm able to focus and retain the information that I mm -hmm. that I either am reading or absorbing much better than later in the day. Why is that? Well, you know, different people have different cycles of how, you know, the circadian rhythms of how they go about sure. the day. It changes with age. It's very personal. You know, a lot of this, and uh, Tim, who I guess brought us together through his yeah. book, you know, and I will talk a lot about finding you know, your own uh, most effective way of, of being at your, at your peak. Yeah, at your peak. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it is a bit of experimentation to know when that, you know, how that happens and when you need a little caffeine boost here, a little physical exercise, a little meditation, a little uh, exposure to nature um, yep. and, and try to, you know, ride out the healthiest, most effective life you can. There's not a one size fits all. Yeah, I find that, that I, I, in the morning, I have a lot of um, concentration. I can absorb for a, a few hours, and then I need to eat or I need to go work out. Mm -hmm. And then after that cycle, after I get my endorphin kick mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm feeling, then I'm, then I'm really calm again. Mm -hmm. And then I can also absorb 
you know, information. I feel like if I miss that workout or if that something, mm-hmm. you know, then I start to get anxious and I mm-hmm. deal with anxiety. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm pretty good at dealing with it, but uh, I, I do find, so would you say that this would be, you know, an all encompassing, so that the video game would be just be one aspect of treating Totally, you know. totally. I don't want to sort of step in the foot, you know, footsteps that the pharmaceutical industry did, which was to basically create a silo around every, not just around the industry, but around every drug was like some holy grail. This is going to treat depression. This is going to treat anxiety. This is going to help your memory. That is, you know, the brain is way too complicated in my in my uh, perspective to do, to have a single treatment like that. So even these games that we're creating, and we have many different ones. I told you about the meditation training game. We have a physical fitness meets cognitive fitness game that's played with motion capture we record heart rate during gameplay and feed that into the game engine so that the the game is always challenging you right at the level of your of your physical abilities driven by your heart rate we have another game in virtual reality that you you navigate on an omnidirectional treadmill trying to find your way out of a maze that we think will prove your memory abilities so all of these should be targeted based on the individual and then of course accompanied by things in 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 the regular world that's not meant to be a placement. As a matter of fact, on our ADHD trial, we had our participants who are 8 to 12 year olds only play for half an hour and then the game cut off and they couldn't play for the next day. We don't want to just create a new addictive um, you know, obsession that uh, pulls young people away from physical exercise, dating, other things that they have to do to develop. So that would be a pretty crappy treatment. So we're we're really sensitive to that, especially because we build our games to be a lot of fun. Like we know that we need that because the bar is high for kids these days and what they're going to tolerate. Yeah, you got all these... You got all these um, Grand Theft Autos exactly. and all these you know things out there that are exactly. that probably aren't very good for us. Probably but, not uh, very good for us. But <laughs> yeah, so we're we we know that that's the landscape that we're we're playing in. Sure. Uh, but yeah, so each each game just targets a different aspect of cognitive function that we want to optimize. Some of them are internal and slower, uh, more mindfulness oriented, mm-hmm. and others are really rapid, information's flying at you. So the game that was in the ADHD trial um, was uh, a game that we created called NeuroRacer. And essentially it's a multitasking game with lots of distraction. It's pushing your brain to To deal improve with, multitasking? Well, the goal is to actually improve attention. Okay. Right. So multitasking is is almost it's you know in, in some ways it's impossible for our brain to do. Mm-hmm. If you have two attention demanding tasks, you're switching between them all the time, and so you're not really parallel processing the way the term sort of implies. Yeah. But if we give you the hypothesis that I had when I built this original game was that if we challenge you to multitask and pushed you to do it through rewards by we on, you only get you only level up in the game if you get better on both of the tasks. What we find is that other other abilities outside of multitasking that use similar brain networks also improve, like your attention. And even your Got sustained it. attention under really boring settings. That was the big leap. That's what we found in older adults in a paper we had in Nature in 2013. And that's what we just found on our ADHD trial. Your attention improves not just on the game, but in other settings, even really boring testing conditions, which is exactly where kids with ADHD have the most difficulties. Sure. I was watching in, in uh, one of your TED Talks, I think, or I can't remember if it was a TED Talk or what it was on. But... Uh, you talked a lot about the new world that we live in, right? With mm-hmm. cell phones and, and the demand for productivity, right? And, mm-hmm. and across every uh, occupation mm-hmm. almost, um, people's um, uh, attention is, is much more demanding now. Um, I, what do you think that that, you know, how do you think that that makes us as human beings? Because I know that when I'm trying to multitask, when I'm trying to text and have a conversation and eat food or whatever, I don't feel as present. Yeah. You know, I don't and feel like I'm, yeah, and it's connected. And I know, I know it's happening when it's happening. But I go, I got to get this email off. I got to get this fucking thing done. Yeah. You yeah. know, we have so many pulls on on where our what we have a limited mental resources, and whether we're aware of that or not, that's the reality. And we can only really put them in one place effectively at a time. Um, and this is so. That question was why I don't like to do five minute interviews. Why I like this longer format sure. um, because my messaging is a little complicated in that way. So. Uh, 
you know, I just finished telling you about we build video games and create technology, use virtual reality and AI to improve brain function. But I just wrote a book called The Distracted Mind, yeah. Ancient Brains in a High Tech World. Well, I want to get that right. We wrote that down <laughs> for me, Tim. The ancient, the distracted brain and yeah. the ancient mind. Yeah. Yeah. So distracted mind. Well, can it, we go back to ancient? Ancient. Can we just go back there? Yeah. I, I like that better. I mean, we have these ancient brains. That's the reality. We have not evolved yeah. to deal with how we are challenged all the time by the information streams that we that we're faced with and technology and now it's being recognized especially you know where i live in san francisco and silicon valley the conversation even by the creators of facebook and other investors in big tech companies like holy shit what do we do we're fucking up we're fucking the world i mean it's 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 a burden and we and and you don't need you know i think uh the book i wrote gives a lot of background about brain function and why and an evolutionary perspective on why this is such a challenge but you said I don't need the book to know that that's going on. Like, yeah. like you said, you're you're you feel the fragmentation of your attention and the consequences. I, I that also it's I feel it really when I when I, I was with my father last night mm. and he's 87 years old, mm. and I feel it. I really notice it when I'm around him because he's not. He right. has managed <laughs> to stay out. Really, of, completely. That's completely impressive. Out. He doesn't. He has a cell phone that only does outgoing calls. Uh-huh. So <laughs> he doesn't. He he hasn't no fallen social media trap no social media he hasn't fallen trap to these things when he was going out and making movies he you know they had a, you you could you could make a call and and you could call somebody and maybe at the end of the day when you're home right and you could focus on the one thing you're doing and do that thing well right. Now I feel it's so fragmented, it's hard to do one thing really well. Oh, yeah, and so that's, you know, so that's the complicated messaging. I think that technology, modern information technology has challenged us at a fundamental level, and it has consequences across every aspect of how our brain works, how we make decisions, how we regulate our emotions and even our aggression, mm-hmm. how we perceive the world, how we remember things. And then that cascades into all these effects in our lives, how we engage in our relationships, how we perform at work or at school, safety on the road, how it impacts our sleep. And that's, that's the reality. That's the harsh truth. Technology is amazing. I know we love it. It's, it's, it's so, it's so awesome. I I use it all just like everyone else. I'm not speaking from some place that I'm like disconnected. No, no, no. I use it, but we just have to recognize how it's challenged us and just take back control of it. I know I try to, um, I, I made a, a resolution this year. I actually made it about eight or nine months ago to really be cognitively aware to get off any technology a few hours before bedtime. Mm-hmm. And That's it's a great really one. helped my sleeping. I've, I've noticed it for years. Like mm-hmm. when I, anytime I was on the phone or dicking around before bed, mm-hmm. that it would really affect my sleeping. I, I, it was harder to fall asleep, you know, it was harder to stay asleep. Mm-hmm. You know, I had stuff in my mind, yada, yada, yada. Now I, go I do like reading before bed like I'll get out a book and I will read and I'll fall asleep that way that's a that's a big one um and especially in kids yeah because you know they're getting up super early to go to school sure they're they're up all night you know on homework or whatever yeah and then on social media media. you know most kids are sleeping with phones under their pillows now so so that if a message comes in they could feel a vibration it's true i know we're like oh terrible it's it's, terrible and so it you know if sleep breaks down sleep is important now we've realized for so many aspects of uh, restoration of memory consolidation has impacts on the immune system It, it leads to all sorts of ramifications and stress and mental and, health and mental health if it's not if it's not um, sufficient and deep and, and regular yeah and um, so that's another big big impact so the messaging that that I like to give if I have enough time is that yes technology has challenged us we need to recognize that make more informed decisions as consumers about how we use our technology and as technology developers how we create it um, and this is a really interesting conversation, hopefully a pivot point in the history of technology that we now think about, is is the technology that we're building, is it going to enhance what makes us human or is it going to diminish it? This should be a part of the development cycle of all new technology in my mind. I get that we need to make profits. It has to be a bottom line. No, I love that. That conversation has to, how is this going to impact? But are they having that conversation? It's starting to happen. Because they're money driven. I mean, uh, let's right. be honest. I mean, I don't th- take anything away from these amazing companies that have spawned up, but they're there to turn a profit. I think the, 
the conversation is not how we how we could avoid making a profit. Sometimes it's about like the double bottom line. How could you make a profit and do some good along the way as well? But a more sophisticated um, discussion is how do you build technologies that help us in all sorts of ways that we you know really really need it right now and make a profit doing it. And, mm-hmm. and, that, and that's okay. And that is, that's the real, that, those are the companies that I visit around here. Those are the companies that I start to, that I create and invest in myself. Um, how can technology elevate us? Um, and there's lots of potential. And I've given, you know, some examples from my own work with closed loop video games and virtual reality, but this is, this is where we have to go. Do you have kids? No, not now. No kids? Not yet, no. I don't have kids, but I, 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 I'm terrified to think of how I would, because I know the way I was raised, and I'm sure probably the way you were raised. Very similar. I, you know, I, I was raised playing outside. I was raised, uh, you know, uh, doing active physical things. I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have any yeah, of that yeah, stuff. Yeah, I didn't have any of that. I would, I would be, I would be very reserved to to let my kids. You know, I mean, I see like the benefit in it, especially when my buddies come over to my house and they stick their kid with the iPad right. and they can shut the hell up for <laughs> an hour and they put the headphones on, we can go drink a beer in the right. backyard. <laughs> but I, I I don't know. I think that, yeah, yeah, I would be, I would be, I would be really scared. Yeah. I think people are really scared and, and, con- and concerned for good reason. Um, we don't fully understand the impact on a developing brain of this type of engagement. Um, so, some of it is the, at the exclusion of face-to-face interaction mm-hmm. and, and, and what, the, what the implications of that are, are known. Some of it is just the, the very short attention span and high, very, very rapid reward cycles of switching between this and that and not sure. deeply engaging in a single task. And that's a skill that we develop, um, even though we might not have wanted to, but you yeah. know, it was like, sit down, pay attention. Oh, I and mean, one of my biggest pet peeves is, is, is going to dinner and seeing, you know, young people just on their phones and not engaged in the dinner, right? Or, yeah. I mean, I've been on some on some terrible dates, I'll tell you, geez, <laughs> where it's, you know, you just, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You're not, and maybe it's an age thing, Yeah, but, but I, it's, it's you know, that they, they grew up with the cell phone and so that's yeah. their lifeline. Yeah, no, we, it freaks we, me we out. need to return to that. And I think, you know, this is another, longer topic, but um, I'm writing a piece right now, an article on what I'm describing as a cognition crisis that, okay. I, that I believe our, our species is facing, That one that we don't talk about, not like we talk about the climate change crisis. And I, I'm more of an optimist, so I, I, I tend to think of this more as a grand challenge to improve cognition, mm. but not, you know, but it is driven by a crisis and everything we've talked about is part of that. Um, how we pay attention, how we make decisions, how we care and feel about the world and each other empathy and compassion, creativity. I don't think that we're evolving as a species in the way we need to, to manage this world that we live in with high, rapid communication and transportation. The, the world's smaller and smaller and it's it's stressing us. And I, I think regardless of your political affiliation, when you look at the news, there's signs of it everywhere. Sure. And so this is something that I care a lot about and, and, and want to th- think carefully how technology you know, look we're not going to get rid of it all we're not putting that genie back in the bottle no we got to manage it better and we got to create a dark genie it's She's out a bad girl out out she is out just to gotta, get us just and gotta she gotta will take us down <laughs> and so how do we make that genie more you know more compassionate and more uh, fun at a party and right so that that's the that's the move right mm-hmm. let's reinvent technology we, we've done what we've done let's recognize it and let's make that make that genie a better dance partner I read something somewhere that our brain is only equipped to deal with or to 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 know i think a few hundred people like well right and i look in my phone book right. and I, I, there's like a th- couple thousand people in there and I don't and I don't know who half them are <laughs> i have the same experience you know <laughs> and and it's not because i'm a dick yeah it's because your Sometimes brain can't Sometimes people tip. call me a dick. They're like, <laughs> but I, I'm like, I meet so many people all yeah. the time. Yeah. And the same. in such yeah. at a rapid pace. Yeah. I, I don't, you know, in, unless you're in my circle, yeah. do you do you know anything about that in your studies or in, in, in reason what, I mean, how the, far you can stretch your bandwidth? The, there's a long list of things that we want our brains to do, but they're not capable of doing. 
Sure. A long list. I mean, even remembering names, right? And that's like the biggest thing of you're getting older, you're forgetting names. Yeah. That's never easy for anyone. Okay. Because they're these abstract Making associations. They're abstract. Yeah. You know, there was a time when like Goldsmith was like the Goldsmith, you know, it's easy to remember, sure. you know, yeah, that's yeah, where you yeah. go. Um, but, you know, now, uh, you know, the, the number of people that we meet because of how technology has changed is you know, much larger than knowing your your town, small town. Sure. And the act of pairing a name with a face, associative memory, is actually a very hard thing to do. But we take it for granted because it's so important for our daily lives. And you just kick yourself when you see someone. It's good enough if you recognize them, uh-huh. and then you're like, yeah. mm, uh, no well, name, no uh, name not popping a up. Chance, asshole. <laughs> yeah. You know, so I I don't really try to get over preoccupied with that. I, I my latest thing is to find that maybe 100 people, which is still a lot, yeah. and just get deeper on those relationships. Yeah, spend, man, all about quality, yeah, not spend quantity. Spend more time, even when I was just here in LA, you know, found my, you know a lot of my friends here that I don't see often in LA, and go out for dinner and just really talk and pay attention to each other, and that's uh, that's sort of how I'm trying to deal with that no, overload great. right now. That's great. Well, okay, tell me about, how, does that, how do these pharmaceutical companies feel about what you're doing? Great question. They they love it. They love it. They love it. That's a really? sudden, yes. It was not predicted by me or my board or or co founders when we started. We speculated that maybe they were going to create hurdles. Do do does the pharmaceutical industry are they as evil and and controlling as sort of they've been dramatized in film and tel- television. I mean, can they create hurdles that sort of shut they, you down? They certainly can. I mean, as all business, big, big business, this is big farmer, there's sure. other, you know, big oil, there's other yeah. big com- big industries. There are colossal, global, sure. multi-billion lobbies, so powerful, they could do a lot uh, if they want to. But this is sort of a right time, maybe even right time, right place, right person, right people, um, w- w- with what we're trying to do with with these new types of medicines using interactive media, video games in, in particular, because everyone recognizes that our current treatments for the mind, I'm using that globally to include all the things we've been talking about, sure. are not effective enough. And we've, we've just been too focused on them without you know marginalizing everything else and so from the regulators like the FDA to the practitioners like the physicians to reimbursers like insurance companies to the creators like pharmaceutical companies all recognize that we need something else right now and so that's so that's a, a that's great that's great so everyone you know our biggest investors in my company in our in our series B uh, round were pharmaceutical companies and part of some pharmaceutical wow. company invest, investment arms, um, and so wh- how whether we partner with them, how we do this, we don't necessarily need a traditional sales force the way they had for pharmaceuticals. Um, our side effect profile is very low, as you might sure. imagine, but we're we're. Well, if you if you oh. prove that this is extremely helpful, right, or maybe mm-hmm. you have already, yeah. Uh, that's then right. every parent's going to want it. They want their kids to do it. Then the schools are going to have to have it, right? Which is a good. I mean, it's a po- all positive. It's all thing. positive. Yeah. And so, how this is going to change the pharmaceutical industry? Like these are open-ended questions. ADHD is the first that Achilles is, is uh, targeting for uh, clinical approval, but right behind it is depression, which is even bigger. Sure. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is really exciting times, and there's a lot of unknowns, but. We're talking 36 months. This is all going down, and we're going to see all this happen, you know, really just over the next, you know, even two years. What do you find that you guys are just making that bigger of leaps now? Or is there, there, there more data? What's how, you know? Well, we're accelerating because a lot of what we've been doing, both at, at UCSF and Achille and even other companies that I work with, is uh, building the infrastructure, the design principles, the teams to create essentially what's a new field, and it takes time. And so it might look like we're going slowly, but we're working as, as fast as we can, but now we're reaching that sort of tipping point where uh, the data is reaching that very highest level of rigor and regulatory approval, and we're building, we know how to build more effective experiences now. So, and now investors are like, I get it, okay, I see what's going, you know, we were begging, you know, it was really hard to raise money for this 10 years ago, or, you know, eight years ago when we were coming out with our with our first uh, round. People were like, are you, 
your video game. So your entertainment, you're not a drug, so you're not medicine. And how, you know, it was just a sure, lot of confusion. You're creating a new space. But now people are like, oh, I get this. And so it's happening. It's happening. Right. With that said, why do you need FDA approval? for a video game? Why can't you just throw it out on iTunes and Great let everybody have at it? It, it? It's funny because to us, this was, you know, we, we built this slowly, so it's such a clear pathway, but it actually has been a little polarizing and not everyone thinks this is the right re, right way to go. So first I wanna be clear that as I wear a lot of hats, so it's confusing. As the director of Neuroscape at UCSF, that's an academic center where we're incubators. So I mentioned the meditation training game, the VR game. Those are not on a clinical pathway or on any other pathway. They're just, we're inventing them. Achilles is a company I created that has is going through one of the many possible pathways with one of the technologies. And the goal there was to essentially, you know, disrupt is an overused word, but to disrupt the the medical world where we have a doctor will go for one treatment if they think that their patient has ADHD. That's it. So if we're going to change how we think about medicine, we have to go through the FDA pathway. You cannot have a treatment that you tell a parent, a physician is going to help your child with ADHD if it's not FDA approved. That's illegal. That's that you'll get shut down. But so uh, so if, if that's your claim, then you have to do that. If you want to just say we help attention, sure. But sure. we really want to help clinical to target, that. to target that. So how though, don't all these doctors know that Ritalin and Adderall aren't good for you? Well, you know, it's you know, in all fairness, and, some and correct kids, me when I'm wrong, because I, no, I, mean, well, I, 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 I always thought of it as as one molecule off meth. Well, you know, look, it, it, it's it's a nuanced discussion because there are certainly um, parents that will not allow their kids to take it under any circumstances. There are kids that won't tolerate it. And then there are other kids that are helped by it in a big way. Sure. And they're able to stop fidgeting in class. Whether or not they're actually paying better attention and it's really helping their grades is, is another question. But it definitely has benefit for, for many children. Benefit in the short term. What about long term? This is These are big questions. And, and doctors know this. But for the most part, you know, people are desperate for a solution. Like their kid is disruptive in class sure. and they need to chill them out and, 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 and then move forward. And hopefully that allows them to take in information better. But you're right. We don't think that we're seeing the relationship between being calmer in class necessarily on stimulants and how your education is progressing. And so, so that's why. But or why not question the way that the schooling structure is put together? You know, I mean, it seems like every kid had have ADHD. I can't sit in a fucking chair for eight hours. I'll go fucking nuts after two hours. I'm crazy in here. I'm like, I gotta get up. I gotta go do something. Well, it's I'm, a great point. I'm, I mean, why not shake up the school the way that schools are you're, structured? You're, you're, you're eight just, hours. You're asking awesome questions because, <laughs> and, and and these are great because. So we have our ADHD program, and I think we talked a lot about the need for that. Mm -hmm. But along the way, we realized that why wouldn't every kid need a better attention span? Why wouldn't they all need um, a, a higher level ability to regulate their emotions, to control you know depression and anxiety? Suicide is is increasing in children. It's it's tragic. They're not. We're not building their minds. Right. A lot of the education system is about transferring information content. Now we're like, okay, we have to do skill development, but we're still not really focusing and assessing how their, their minds are functioning. And so we're now looking at how our technologies, like we've been describing in the clinical domain, could get into the classroom could help every kid. Why don't we understand how every child's brain is functioning? It, not just if they have a learning disability. Right now, sure. we would only know if we thought you had a learning disability. And then they could go home and their homework could involve playing some of these games to try to improve their sustained attention and then see if that could get back into the classroom. I'm not saying the entire classroom structure shouldn't change also, but these are the approaches that we're taking. So we have our clinical program to get things in doctors' hands to get them re reimbursed by insurance. That's a big deal for yeah. parents to, you know. So this, we, we want to create a new type of medicine, but we also want to create a new type of educational tool as well. Sure. No, that may, I mean, that makes sense. And, and, and that's, that's, um, that's good. You're doing that. What do you take? What do you take personally for cognitive help? Like, do you take any sort of supplements? 
I don't really do any supplements. It's uh, no. This is how you know, Tim and I have had very conversations over the sure. years. I'm not a big supplement guy yeah. either. No, I don't really take anything. I, you know, my general view of supplements is, you know, if you can have, if you're fortunate enough to to live and have the resources to have a, a clean diet, to have a clean diet yeah. that's well balanced and 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 you know as natural as possible. There's not a great need for supplements, and mm-hmm. and I would I, I I believe there's data to support that. Uh, so I don't really rely. Well, on a lot supplements. of the a lot of the problem too is is not not that the there would be, you know, not a benefit from supplements if they were in their pure form. That's right? true too. I mean, a lot of these companies are just complete bullshit, yeah. and they're not regulated. Filler, not regulated yeah, so out you of know other countries. Yeah. you know. So you know, I I, I always say that I, I look at five five pillars of brain health. Um, physical exercise, which I try to do Love it. at least five days a week. Yep. Cognitive challenge, um, and that might be what we're doing right now. Sure. It doesn't have to be our games that we create, although that would fall in that category. We, we look at the, the interactive media that we create as more of like optimization tools. You're not doing them all the time, but having a rich, you know, interactive life, socially traveled, the, you know, in music, these are the things that also strengthen a brain. So cognitive challenge after physical exercise stress management which is complex because it does definitely does not mean no stress our brain does not like comfort complete comfort passive entertainment not good but you don't want to have that helpless stress that 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 has shown to have negative effects on the brain so it's you know it's like all these things it's a balance of enough stress to push you but not so much that you're helpless that it it actually causes degeneration in the brain Um, and then nutrition as we've just been talking about and then sleep Sleep, oh, and it sleeps so good. Yeah, and and you know we've we've ignored it. You know, and also like people think it's tough. Like I don't need sleep. It's like yes, you do. You need sleep. You need Everyone sleep. needs it. But it became like bragging rights. Like oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. Stuff like that. Yeah. It's nonsense. Yeah. So you know, managing those five things are you know what I try to do. So when you do sleep, what what is that? Why is that? I mean, I I obviously know it feels. good great when I get a good night's sleep. I think clearer. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm on the top of my game, but why, what does sleep actually do? Is it just like shutting down the computer? Um, it, 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 it is a little bit like that. Um, it has lots of different aspects that we're just figuring out now. One of my buddies, um, Matt Walker, wrote a book called Why We Sleep, which I'll, I'll recommend. It's, it's great. He's a, a colleague, friend of mine at Berkeley, and um, he, he, he dives deep into it. That's his expertise. Uh, but, you know, our you know, from, from the, the world that I know better in terms of memory, our brain networks actually when you're offline, your brain is not quiet when you sleep. It's quite active. REM sleep looks like an awake brain if you look at EEG and, you know, a lot of ways. And so what you're doing is you're you're reconnecting those, those um, networks that were engaged during the day and consolidating those memories and allowing you, you know, we and Matt has shown in his work and others that you won't remember as well if you don't have a good night's sleep. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that those old, you know, you have to sleep on it is, is actually true. And then there's other benefits with like with the lymphatic system and clearing out um, toxins. And so there's, you know, it's more unknown than known still, but we've learned a lot about it and we know how critical it is for, for health, for health. Got it. And when you're, when you're young though, when you're a kid, I mean, I feel like I slept amazing. As a kid, well, I, I played football, and I, you know, I was, I was, su- I was a really active kid, so I was exhausted every day. Right, and there, I didn't, I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have any of that shit, so yeah. there right. was nothing. I just went to bed. Yeah, well, you know, I think there is something to be said about being exhausted when you hit being the exhausted. bed. Like I hit the bed and like my head hits the pillow and I'm like, oh, and I'm like out. I know, I know, I love it. I love being exhausted. <laughs> now, even now today, I love like running my body into the ground where you just sleep so yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> And I also find, do you do, do you do yoga at all? A little bit, yeah. My wife does it more than I do, but I That's I do, good, I she's in it. the back behind the curtain. Yep. We are it's on your yoga, yoga team. Back there. <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I always push that uh, pretty hard because, uh, I do yoga like at night. Mm -hmm. I'll do it at night. I'll go like a hot yoga class at night before I go to sleep. And it's, I mean, talk about a good night's sleep. Yeah, I enjoy it. Um, I do a a lot of speaking and uh, sometimes I'll give a talk at uh, like a retreat center, uh, Mm -hmm. which I have one coming up next week. And, you know, then you have like the full, you know, I'll like dive in full days of yoga. I'll like do do the whole thing. So I like it. I like it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, It's it's really cool what you're doing. Tim, you wanted to talk a little bit about um, 
about some psychoactive uh, drugs and the effect on your mind, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, you had mentioned um, depression earlier and how, mm-hmm. how big of a problem that is. And just from my personal experience, I had shied away from anything that wasn't, you know, an approved USDA pharmaceutical drug for mm-hmm. my whole life. And just a few years ago, I experimented a little bit with psychedelics and mm-hmm. found a <clears throat> profound change in, mm-hmm. in just opening up pathways and perspectives and, and, and new avenues to, mm-hmm. to, to see things as they work. So... I guess the question is just neurologically, what is what is happening in that realm? This may be outside of the realm of your expertise, but I know that there are neuro- neurologists out there that are studying this kind of thing and in, in, in the realm of PTSD mm-hmm. and all kinds of things, psilocybin is, is being it's, touted as. It's endlessly fascinating to me. We were actually at a friend's house yesterday, uh, a filmmaker, Louis Schwartzberg, um, who has, he, he actually does this amazing, he's the master creator essentially of time-lapse nature photography. He's had some amazing uh, TED Talks where you can watch, you know, decay and, and life and flowers, flowers blooming. blooming. Mm-hmm. He's, yeah. If you've seen a lot of that, it's, oh, yeah. a lot of it's his, but he has a piece coming out that he's working on for 12 years on uh, mushrooms, mm-hmm. all about mushrooms, oh, not really? just not just the uh, psychedelic effects, although that's covered in there in, in detail. And we just watched it last night, so it's a timely question. Yeah. Uh, and I have friends like Stephen Ross at NYU who, who's doing um, you know research, really high level research, uh, lots of other groups at Johns Hopkins uh, on showing that these uh, chemicals are also medicine. And we know that the war on drugs pretty much shut down all that research a couple decades ago. Sure. Uh, and now it's being rediscovered. And I find it fascinating. Um, the potential to create transformational experiences in a single dose or a couple doses is just beyond you know anything that I've seen in traditional medicine or even in the things we create. They're not really transformational. They're more practice based. And I think there's a there's a place for both of those things for having that epiphany that changes how you view the world, um, and then also having a practice based approach that allows sure. you to make it more sustainable. I'm really interested in the interaction of those two types of experience. So I, I think it's a it, you know it's a interesting area to understand how we can reach back to some of these powerful chemicals, even a lot more powerful than the ones that we've created in the labs, and understand how they can be coupled with these other things. So like when I talk to my colleagues that work on that, I'm like, where I want to come in on this, and I'm not ready yet, because you do want to disrupt the thing at a time in my mind. Sure. <laughs> I'm not starting to push these things. I'm not ready for that. Yeah. Yeah. But picture psilocybin delivered you know, in a very spe- specific, precise way, coupled with a virtual reality experience. That, oh, wow. that is challenging you in a closed loop as like a higher level guide on how you incorporate these pathways that are opening with, um, with an experience. That is where eventually I think I would like to go is blending them together. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're not quite there yet. But right. it's interesting. Absolutely. I know any time I've ever done uh, mushrooms or like any sort of psychoactive, uh, it definitely has made me more empathetic Mm -hmm. right I've had more empathy Mm -hmm. for people's Mm -hmm. emotions and just it's an interesting I don't know you know I don't know how that fits into the where that works in the brain I'm sure it's probably being studied it it is is you know it that that part of neuroscience has lagged empathy compassion even things like creativity and uh, you know a lot of the the softer parts um, of, of how our brain works which is not true but that's how it's sort of been classified has has been delayed on understanding the mechanisms involved. Although there are great re- researchers like my colleague R- Richie Davidson doing a lot of really seminal work in understanding the neural networks involved in things like empathy and compassion. And until we wrap our heads around that, it it, it is hard to uh, fully understand the mechanisms of how a substance like psilocybin could generate it or MDMA. Uh, but I think one thing that is clear is that we need more empathy and compassion Mm -hmm. in this world, (laughs) desperately. And so all of the ways that we might instill that, especially in young people that are still figuring it out, is is really fascinating to me. And I think interactive experiences like the ones we've largely been discussing and when necessary, um, these other substances and how that all works together, that's all really fascinating uh, research area for the future. Is there, um, just for, for younger people that may be listening, is there a concern at, a, at younger ages in, in experimenting with those kinds of things? 
there's always concern mm -hmm. about altering the brain during these developmental stages, which go up until the early 20s when it comes to the development of like the prefrontal cortex, because we, we just don't know. So, you know, we don't know the impact of too much social media, virtual reality, um, and these substances we're talking about. So yeah, this concern, and a lot of that concern is, is due to ignorance, but due to respect for the fact that these are the most plastic stages of our lives then the brain is really responsive and we have to be thoughtful about the influences that um that we're exposing young minds to right i just felt cheated i mean i i, I was prescribed uh, zoloft when i was 16 mm -hmm. years old and they said you have to take it the rest of your life yeah Jesus. and then uh and you're 42 42 yeah and then just one experience with dmt was, yeah. was more profound than 20 years of, of that shit. Yeah, it, it's you really know? it's really is unfortunate what happened in my mind. Um, you know, I'm skirting right on the line here with a sure, lot of sure, things, sure. But, with, okay. but with psychedelics, I think that we, nothing should be off the table when it comes to scientific investigation, uh, and it was. I understand there were lots of political ramifications and social, and I get that, but you know, as a scientist, it pains me to see something blocked off from investigation because we'd know a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and and now that's happening again. So that's a that's a good thing. Yeah. So when will these games? Do you? What's the timeline? Do you think that you uh, you want to go FDA first? Yeah. So the F, So the Achilles pathway is to have this game approved for pediatric ADHD, and we hope that that could happen before the end of this year. Wow. Because we've, we've been working on this a long time. Uh, we finished our, our big da data uh, trial um, at the end of 2017, but if not, early 2019. Okay. 2019. 2019. 2019. We will, uh, we will be waiting in anticipation. Yeah. It'll be, uh, it'll be news. Let's just say that. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, it was really great to talk to you today. Yeah, nice talking with you um, too. I'm really excited about what you're doing. I think it's it's amazing because I've been saying for years this Adderall generation's got to stop. Yeah, now yeah, well, we're about to change it. Yeah, that's really great, man. Hey, it was nice. Thanks meeting. for coming in. Thank you.